my lady, uh, my lords, my ladies. Um, as I rise to speak, I note that I am uh, perhaps the first council so far who doesn't have a title. Um, that's not a hint. Um, I'm perfectly proud and happy being an O'Neill. But we have heard from two council, uh, Lord Keane and Lord Panic, who are both active parliamentarians in the House of Lords. Lord Keane, indeed, is an active minister in the present UK government, now presenting and defending government policy not only before this court, but also in the House of Lords. In some sense, then, he's acting in his own cause, and we know what's said about lawyers who act in their own cause. But the point I wish to make is that the quality that might be most necessary in this case for the understanding and the untangling of the issues involved of this, <coughs> the tying up between law and politics and the Constitution, is a bit of distance. Distance lends perspective, <coughs> it lends discernment, sometimes it might lend disenchantment. So, what I would say in general terms is that one of the advantages which the inner house had in this case, which the divisional court did not, is precisely that of distance. What this means is that this court in this appeal has had the advantage of a view from the periphery. What all of this heated debate, political machinations, looks like <coughs> from 400 miles away. Far from the fever and excitement of the nation's capital, outside the Westminster bubble. Albeit, as appears sometimes from some comments from press and some less informed parliamentarians, that the decision is from a country of which we know less and care little. But distance is important. We know, for example, that the uh, Constitutional Court in Germany, the Bundesverfassungsgericht, sits not in Berlin, uh, nor in Frankfurt, <coughs> the political and financial capitals, but in the sleepy town of Karlsruhe, because it's thought important in the structure of a constitutional court that one has that possibility of getting a sense of distance, of gaining a sense of perspective from everyday politics. And of course, this court knows that. This court goes on circuit. This court sits throughout the Union in Edinburgh, Cardiff, Belfast, as well as in London. The other advantage, as we know from distance, perspective, is the positive aspect which is played in our system by the fact that we have judgments coming from the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg and also from the Court of Justice of the European Union in Luxembourg. And sometimes those judgments give us new perspectives, challenge our presuppositions, make us think again about what things look like from the outside. It gives us a chance to see ourselves as other seers. Now, of course, in many cases, this court, as part of its devolution jurisprudence, has taken cases uh, from Scotland, notably, in which there have been challenges made to primary legislation coming from the Scottish Parliament. And the interesting thing about that is, first of all, there is already a full constitutional judicial review in the American sense, jurisprudence, of this court and of the Scottish courts. <clears throat> that they are used to dealing with challenges which look to and require evidence on and assessment of the proportionality, for example, of primary legislation, the assessment of the rationality of policy choices 
uh, that have been made. And this court has, on a number of occasions, said that some legislation which has proceeded after full policy debate, after a full democratic backing from a parliament in Scotland, this court has said, well, actually looking at it dispassionately from a distance, acting as a constitutional court, we see that that judgment was wrong. It happened, of course, we know, in the, in the named uh, person's case, in which uh, a, a number of the members of this court uh, sat, as well as in legislation relating to uh, sex offenders and the possibility of a defence due to lack of knowledge of uh, sexual partner's age. Now, those cases, those two cases I mentioned in passing, interestingly, this court overturned the position that had been taken in the courts uh, in Scotland. But in a sense, this case may be seen as the inner house returning the favour which this, house has pre this court has previously given. It is giving for this court a more dispassionate view, a more distance view, a better perspective on the issues which have arisen. So I commend the approach which was taken by the inner house. The judgments bear careful rereading. They are measured and proper, and they are a court acting to protect the Constitution. And ultimately, that is the role of this court. Again, by way of preliminary points, one thing which has arisen and I want to underline is perhaps the importance of history. Now, as we know, in England, it's sometimes said the past is another country. They do things differently there. But sometimes in Scotland, and I suspect Ireland and Wales, the past isn't even past. It's here and now. For example, uh, at, when the uh, Parliament uh, was prorogued by the Lords Commissioner coming in and summoning the House of Commons uh, to hear uh, the reading out of the prorogation uh, order, a, a number of MPs stayed behind. A number of the Scottish ones, as I understand it, started then singing Scots Wahi. That's slightly odd, you'd think, singing a song about a, a battle of Bannockburn in 1314 penned by Robert Burns, singing a song about a history written in tears and blood. But the fact is, it was the first thing that people reached for. History is important. Now, sometimes it appears from my practice down here in England that the only two dates which are significant in English history are 1066 and 1966. And there's a bit of a gap in the 900 years. Of course, there is a reference to You might have world. to explain why 1966 was so <laughs> Particularly to the Scots. Well, <laughs> indeed, I, I know nothing of that year. Um, I was only five. Um, but there it is. Um, there is, of course, a, a, also a res the other resonant historical memory is the, the Second World War, so we get lots of invocations of Churchill and the Dunkirk spirit and the Battle of Britain. I note that um, when, uh, during the Conservative leadership election, uh, when uh, the idea of corrugation of Parliament by whomever was going to be the successful uh, leadership the winner of the, of the battle. When that was being mooted, I think um, one of the candidates, Matt Hancock, suggested that his father hadn't landed on the Normandy beaches in D-Day to allow things like prorogation of Parliament to take place. It's just, I very much doubt it was, well, that was one of the first things on his mind. But what is important 
from this is la longue durée, seeing things again in perspective, not just the physical distance, but seeing things, how our constitution has developed and will develop rather than concentrate necessarily on the immediacy of the particular machinations that have gone on in this case. The third preliminary point I want to make is about symbolism. This court is very conscious of the symbolism in its creation. I look down, there's a carpet. This isn't a commentary on self-furnishing. What it is, however, is it notices what's being said. Symbols speak. Emblems are there for a reason. And what we have before us is a court which picks out four national emblems. A flax, a thistle, a rose and a leek. And it keeps on maintaining that motif. From the banner over there, we see it again. We see the flax, the thistle, the rose, and the leek embraced in an omega, the last instance. Embraced in a matrix. And presumably what that imagery, that iconography is telling us is that this court cherishes, protects, and nourishes the four traditions that together make up this union. Importantly, of course, and I remember at the time there was some controversy as to whether or not this court should, this court's banner or emblem should um, have a crown on it. I understand that it now does, not I presume that simply to acknowledge uh, the fact that this court also has a jurisdiction in criminal matters, where, of course, the monopoly of the Crown, at least in Scotland, but certainly uh, the, the main uh, influence of the Crown in criminal matters is uh, has to be acknowledged, not only in the prosecution of offences, but also in the incarceration uh, on <coughs> conviction. But otherwise, one would not say that that flag is, to use the old Latin, vexilla regis, the banner of the king, its vexilla legis, the banner of the law. This flag, that emblem, all chosen not by me, but by people who wished to symbolize what this court was about, is saying that the rule of law matters. The rule of law matters within the context of respect for the four traditions the histories, the perspectives that make up our union and that those will receive a hearing and respect and understanding before this court. But are you really suggesting, Mr O'Neill, that we might um, dismiss the government's appeal in your case uh, and dismiss Lord Panic's appeal in Mrs Miller's case? Uh, luckily not. I do understand the idea of constitutional coherence because... You're presenting us with all manner of challenges, but I think that might be a step too far. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not suggesting it at all. What I'm suggesting is that definitely find against the appeal in my case. And that will then, if that creates a higher standard of constitutional or judicial review, then that is the standard which then becomes standard throughout the Union. That is what I suggest. Because, from a constitutional perspective, the maintenance of the rule of law, as well as the maintenance of the Union, must be one which says the higher standard, wherever it be found, on matters which govern us all, such as the Constitution, should be the one uh, which follows. So that's why I'm not going to address what, it's, what English law is about. I'm here to talk about Scots law. And that's not a petty political nationalist point. It's actually just taking seriously 
this court's own emblems. We know enough Scots lawyers and novelists who were also political unionists while being cultural nationalists. What a Scot! He invented Scottishness. Robert Louis Stevenson, John Buchan. So, all that I'm trying to underline here, as this court, acting as a constitutional court, will be well aware that we live in a union state. We don't live in a state of uniformity. We don't describe this as a nation state, but a state of nations. Certainly from that legal point of view, which is all that this court can probably be concerned with. And that's why that central imagery, that icon, is placed uh, before this court for all who plead before it to see. Now, the importance of that is profound. Kipling once said, what do they know of England who only England know? And of course, we've got Macbeth, erroneously called the Scottish play. It's the British play. It's written at a time... It's a Jacobean play written to explain to a shocked English court what's happened now that a Scotsman has taken over the throne. A Scotsman who says he's abolishing England and creating a new country, Great Britain. A country without history. That history has to be reimagined, reinvented, created that's what Macbeth is doing. One of the lines that always strikes me and Macbeth is Macduff coming back up and saying, stand Scotland where it did. And the response is, alas, poor country, almost afraid to know itself. Now, in a sense, that can be applied here and now, not just to Scotland. That is what we're faced with country almost afraid to know itself. And a country knows itself in part when it recognises its history, when it acknowledges its diversity, and when it knows what its constitution is. And that's the role of this court at this time, in this case. <clears throat> and this idea of the diverse voices is again important because one gets that necessary insider-outsider perspective, what uh, Professor Neil McCormick at Edinburgh University would call the hermeneutic perspective, that sense of distance, that awareness of tradition, that respect for difference and diversity. So what I want again to underline in this case, because there was reference being made uh, by uh, the UK government, both from uh, Lord Keane and Sir James, to uh, how unfortunate wouldn't it be were the law to differ as between the north bank of the Tweed and the south bank of the Tweed. It would be terribly inconvenient. Well, I agree. But what I would counsel this court against finding is any new Orwellian motto, north of Tweed good, south of Tweed better. Don't presume that. This court, in looking at these issues, from two cases being heard simultaneously from two of our traditions, has the opportunity, has the responsibility of acting as the fulcrum of the Union, in which the different constitutional and legal traditions which make up our Union polity are heard, and by which we're all made the richer by hearing 
different voices from other rooms. Final point about symbolism and history is to remember where this court is placed. We know, of course, there was much debate about what building might be suitable for a new Supreme Court. There was some suggestion, I think, that uh, we may want to move to Somerset House off the Strand. Objections, I think, as I understand it, were made that well, that would make it all just too close to the Inns of Court and the Royal Courts of Justice, and that as a court of the Union, it was important to have a bit of distance from the natural centres of the English legal system. So what we have is this court placed in this building on this square. A vast square, symbolic, important. Behind us, Parliament. On the right, Westminster Abbey, the church. On the left, the buildings of government. So again, the placing of this court speaks again of an iconography of the state, the four pillars of the state, the unity of the state, the stability of the state, with Parliament to legislate, the church to pontificate, in the sense of building bridges, pontifex meaning bridge builder, the government to regulate, and this court uh, to adjudicate. All of those are about are what the rule of law is about. But this square also has dark reminders of when the rule of law fails. Its statues tell another story. We've got a statue of Oliver Cromwell standing before Parliament, <coughs> a signatory of the death warrant of Charles I, And Whitehall, it's not simply the place where government happens, but where Charles I is executed on the orders of a man who eventually, in irritation at Parliament, styming his policies and getting in the way of his rule, abolished it. And then invaded Scotland and abolished Scots law. But that's okay, it wasn't a dictatorship, it was a protectorate. It was looking after you, as long as you weren't Irish or Catholic, of course. And Westminster Abbey is not simply a church. It's not simply a royal peculiar, a place where coronations occur in all their pomp and majesty. It's also the meeting place for the evangelical divines who were summoned by a civil war parliament in 1643 and got together and abolished the order of bishops in the Church of England and re-established it as a Calvinist Presbyterian body on orthodox Scottish lines and we still have the Westminster Confession of Faith of 1647 which resulted there from which still forms a foundational document for the Church of Scotland. So even within the church building there are symbols of reminders of <coughs> breakdown, civil war, revolution. But we also have other statues. There's a statue of Nelson Mandela, a reminder of civil resistance against unjust regimes, but ultimately a reminder of the triumph of truth and reconciliation, the re-establishment of the rule of law, and the establishment of a properly constitutional court. And finally, of course, immediately outside this court, is a statue of Abraham Lincoln, a reminder of another civil war, but who, at a time of great constitutional crisis in his own nation, when it was questioning its fundamental identity, said, we are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection touched as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature. 
Those are the images. Those are the matters. That is the backdrop against which this court is determining the issues before it. And no doubt you're going to turn to those issues. Right now. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> to a dolly zone. That was just the credits. Um, so, yeah. Um, let's get back down to the quotidian. Um, the um, appeal is not about prerogative power and how it might ever lawfully be used. And I think there's a hell of a lot of confusion going on about that. But prerogative power is used as if it's some kind of magic. And that cases that refer to prerogative power we've been referred to as if they were all saying the same thing and principles could be applied from one particular power to another because they were all about prerogatives, weren't they? But it's really a, a collection of residual random powers which don't necessarily have anything much to do with one another. So therefore, it's not good enough to say this is prerogative, therefore it applies to everything which we call prerogative. Prerogative, it's an omnium gatherum. It doesn't actually give you any analytical heft simply by saying this is prerogative. It will depend on what prerogative power we're talking about. What are the circumstances in which it is being used? And what are the potential limits which might be uh, seen in relation to it? You can see the omnium gatherum aspect by the fact it goes from having uh, conducting foreign relations, declaring war, and giving honours, pointing to the cabinet, proroguing parliament. Nothing really much to do with one another at all. So, frankly, and with respect to my Lord Carnwath, relying on cases such as Sandiford is not necessarily particularly helpful or illuminating. Sandiford, frankly, was not this court at its finest hour. Oh, how to win friends and influence. Well, I'm sorry, lady. <laughs> it's the usual Scottish way of, I just don't know how to be polite. Um, and I don't recall who was the unsuccessful advocate. I was the unsuccessful advocate, but you know, I'm not bishop. I'm not bishop. But, no, but, no sour grapes at all. No, no. None whatsoever, and this is not getting my own back time. And um, also, Mr O'Neill, not every Scotsman uh, is ignorant of how to be polite. Yes, I know, my lord, and you're a great model to me, and I will follow it henceforth. Um, but Thank you. what I would say is that Sandiford is specific to its facts, and the facts are important, and the facts were it involved a woman, a British national, who was sentenced to death by firing squad on a beach in Bali, and the Foreign Office were not making available to her funds to help conduct her legal defence. Those were the facts. And various arguments were applied and tested before the court, uh, the uh, administrative court, divisional court, I think it was, uh, and then the court of appeal. And then it was allowed to come to appeal on this house, but only on a point about the fettering of uh, discretion. The interesting points of EU law and the charter and extraterritoriality of the charter Speaking of actually, I think from a judgment of Lord Lloyd Jones on that, the, those were not given permission. So we have a case which limped into this court on the basis of a common law argument, which is the only thing that was allowed to be argued, on the basis of an argument about whether or not the fettering of discretion, a doctrine as applied in statute matters, could be applied matatis mutandis uh, to uh, the, uh, the issue of giving legal aid where not otherwise mandated by statute, which was then said to be a prerogative power. So the judgment of the court was and was only that that particular power to give money, if so advised, to British nationals facing trial abroad was not something that you could claim the fetching of discretion 
applied to because it was completely discretionary. There was no outside standards to be applied to it in the way that you could perhaps glean from words of a statute. And that's all it said. But what it also said, importantly, is that other grounds of review were, in principle, uh, open, even although this was, as it were, a totally, totally voluntary uh, exercise of power uh, by the government without any statutory uh, backing. So, if anything, not a great case <coughs> on its result, but if anything, uh, supportive uh, to me, in that it confirms that the court does have a jurisdiction and that prerogative power, a claim of this being prerogative, is not a get out of jail or get out of judicial card, judicial review card free. I suppose if uh, we've been reading um, Lord Sale's chapter, uh, he might classify the Sandiford power as a common law power rather than a prerogative one. Yeah, a, th a third source. Mm. Um, I indeed, and, and I was going to make that point about... Anybody the, can pay money. Well, indeed, and the Air Centre case, which was being referred to, which mm. I just found on my desk this morning, um, I mean, that's about that's, that's a third source common law power. It's like a public body can do what a private body can do. So it's not really taking you anywhere. So this appeal, what is this appeal about? It is and is only about the exercise of the power of prorogation of Parliament by this executive in the manner, at the time, and for the period which has been chosen by the order on 20th of August 2019. Contrary to what was being suggested by both uh, uh, Lord Keane and Sir James, this is not uh, asking this court to create a whole new set of rules on just when prorogation might be used, for how long, in what circumstances, nor is it mandating or requiring that Parliament come back and sit if the prorogation order is quashed, which is what I will be asking for. All that is saying is that this court applies its critical intelligence and judicial review uh, jurisdiction as a constitutional court to determine whether the manner in which this power was exercised in the circumstances of this case at this time, at this particular time, was consonant with fundamental principles of our constitution. That's not something for which there are no judicial or manageable standards. That is most certainly the province of the courts to determine. Now, I've set out in the case, uh, a somewhat lengthy case, which I understand is being optioned for a screenplay for Braveheart 2. <coughs> um, but there are issues... Yeah, and I tried to set out in bullet point where and what our constitution requires and how best is to be understood. Um, and really, that's at uh, paragraph 1.4 through to 1.10. And I'll just remind the court, because I, I have to apologise for the length of the case, it was uh, done at some considerable haste. You didn't have time to write a shorter Yes. Absolutely, so, my lady, and, and I'm, I apologise to the court for that. But, it's uh, much harder to write a short submission than a long one. It, it so is. The, the amount of it's focus... It's like judgment. Yes. But, yes, it does. It requires an awful lot of time to edit down and, 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 and focus and stuff, and we just had two days in which to produce this. So, uh, so I'm, I'm grateful for the indulgence of the court in, in, in allowing the usual 50-page length to have been uh, extended in this case. But anyway, if I just remind the court of the, of the points which I wish to make, is that parliamentary sovereignty is undoubtedly the animating principle of the United Kingdom Constitution. 
we know that that means, or I say it's clearly inherent in this concept, that the executive is subordinate to the law. That's important because that basic principle seems to be being questioned at times in these febrile times and issues. But that's a fundamental principle. The executive is subordinate to the law and it is accountable to Parliament. So the essence of our Constitution is one of accountability. Accountability to Parliament. We live in a parliamentary representative democracy. So the executive is accountable to Parliament and Parliament is in turn accountable to the people by way of general elections uh, and members of particular constituencies. The executive in this country, unlike in other countries, unlike the United States, is not elected directly by the people. The executive's accountability is therefore not directly to the people. To claim otherwise is not to uphold our constitutional principle of representative parliamentary democracy. Instead, claiming a direct line to the people is not democracy, but populism. Under our constitution, the executive is accountable to, answerable to, has to come before and speak under questioning to the elected representatives of the people who are duly assembled in Parliament. But when, for example, the executive decides to have the people's PMQs by broadcasting on the web interviews and pre-selected questions and answers to it, rather than attend for Prime Minister's question time before Parliament. That is parodying and therefore undermining the true principle upon which our Constitution is based, which is the accountability of the Executive, of Ministers of the Crown, to Parliament. That's what our Constitution protects and embodies. Now, against that background, that the primary understanding is one of accountability by the executive to parliament, any power that the executive has to suspend the sittings of parliament, and we know that it does, can only consistently and lawfully and constitutionally be exercised in a manner which is consistent with that overarching principle of accountability. A power such as prorogation, a unilateral executive act, by the executive closing down parliament, is a derogation from that general constitutional principle of accountability. As a derogation from a general principle, the general principle of the executive subordination to the law and answerability before parliament, that power has to be construed narrowly and strictly. Further, Any justification which may be offered by the executive for the manner in which it has chosen in any particular circumstance to use that power of prorogation, the derogation from the principle of accountability, as Sir James says, it is what it is. That justification has to be looked at by the courts 
using what might be called anxious scrutiny. Precisely because Parliament has no say as to when and how and for what reason and for what period the executive might choose to close down Parliament and so prevent its sitting. In the present case, it appears that the Prime Minister's actions in proroguing Parliament has had the intent and effect of preventing Parliament, impeding Parliament, from holding the government politically to account at a time when the government is taking decisions that will have constitutional and irreversible impacts on our country. That fundamentally alters the balance of our Constitution because it's using the power to allow the executive to govern, to exercise its foreign relations power, to negotiate internationally at this crucial time and all without the proper constitutional accountability to Parliament. That cannot be, in the circumstances of this case, in the manner, at the time, in this period, be a lawful use of the power of prorogation. And it's not a question of how far can you go, how many weeks can I, can I get away with in prorogation? Lord King says it's not 35 days, it's only seven. It doesn't matter how many it is. It's what its effect and intent is. He previously said, Parliament can act incredibly swiftly. Look, it only took them two days to pass the uh, Ben Act, the 2019 Act, mandating extension. Well, if Parliament can do something as monumental as that in two days, just think what it could do in seven, which it is now being prevented from sitting on, even at Lord King's best calculations. How much more might it do if it decided not to go into recess and sit for the full 35 days? How much more calling to account of the government would it be able then to carry out? A profound amount. And I've said the intent and effect. This is an important point. Because we're not simply concerned with the subjective motivations, the political calculations that might have led uh, to this decision at this stage uh, to parole Parliament. Certainly, that is useful to know as far as one can, assuming one can have reliable evidence, and that's a matter we'll come back to. But even if they all inadvertently blunder into something which results in a denial of the principal feature of accountability, their ignorance of our Constitution does not make what they have done lawful. That is why it is what the effect is and not simply the subjective intent. This court, as the guardian of the Constitution, sees how the Constitution is being affected by the use of this power. Looked at objectively, As it happens in this case, even looked at subjectively, what did the Prime Minister apparently intend in using the power of prorogation at this time, in this manner, and for this period? We say it was for an improper purpose and done in bad faith. Now, we know there was a letter circulated when this uh, all uh, blew up on the 28th of August 2019. But before I, I turn to that, just outlining again the timetable by which this case, the case in which I am the respondent, uh, came to this court. This case was raised, this judicial review was raised, on the 31st of July, I think first orders were granted on the 31st of July 2019, it was raised in response to repeated 
leakings or unattributable briefings from well-placed Downing Street sources <coughs> being used, using the press as a sounding board, saying something along the lines of, we can prorogue Parliament over exit day, and that will stymie any suggestion of Parliament stopping or leaving the European Union <coughs> do or die, come what may, on the 31st of October. So, relying on uh, the precedent in the Whiteman case, which I'll be coming back to, and the broader constitutional jurisdiction in defence of the rule of law, which was articulated by the First Division in that case, we applied for judicial review and were given permission for that on the 4th of August. So long before any decision is actually taken, as far as we know, about the prorogation of Parliament, a timetable was then fixed by the court for the pleadings in the case to be adjusted on both sides and eventually a, a timetable in which affidavits and other documents were specifically said to be lodged by, I think that was by the 30th of August. And then there would be a substantive hearing uh, in the case, I think on Friday the 5th of September or thereabouts. So that was the timetable that was fixed in early August. Now, as has become uh, plain from uh, the extracts from the inner house judgment that was that were read out from Lord Keane, pleadings in Scottish judicial reviews matter quite a lot, actually. Um, the Lord President uh, highlights this. He says that, in a sense, there's less of a tradition of relying upon affidavits, although they are perfectly competent and sometimes used in Scottish judicial reviews, because one relies on the good faith of counsel, properly instructed, that they will put in their pleadings a full and candid uh, disclosure of their case, uh, setting out uh, just what uh, they say their position is. In this case, however, despite the fact that we had adjustment of pleadings up until, I think, the 28th of August, what was maintained in the pleadings by the respondent was that this case was academic and hypothetical and that there were no there was no basis for any reasonable apprehension that Parliament might be prorogued in connection with attempting to make it easier to get exit day happening on the 31st of October. Do, do you have the MS number of the, of the relevant pleadings? The pleadings, um, I'm sure that it's yes, it. Thank you. Is it 74 and 135? Uh, the Lord, it's one, page 174 in the, uh, as adjusted at 2nd September. And yeah, now for the first nine times I'm told they're all the various stages of the pleadings. Yeah. Uh, my, my friend Lord Keane refers to as adjusted to the 2nd of September. There was no... Uh, order allowing for adjustment as the 2nd of September. The adjustments that came in after the timetable were unilaterally put in uh, by uh, the respondents and had no court sanction for that. So the period of adjustment uh, finished on the 28th uh, of August. No application was made otherwise. Uh, but in any event, none, nonetheless. Nonetheless. There was an adjustment on the 27th. Yes, we were, we were adjusting. But, I was on holiday. I was adjusting. Yes, but, but can you refer me to the relevant passage, please? Yes, I can refer your Lordship to page 473 MS, Key Law 5, for the what? MS page 473, which is in the reclaiming print, page 51 of the reclaiming print. It's Sorry, we're on a document that starts at page 174 of the... But you're, you're taking this from the reclaiming print at 473. Yes. And it's, 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 it's plea in law 5. It's, Thank uh, you very uh, much. Apologies, the reclaiming print is tab 32. Um, and the reclaiming print is simply the, the pleadings uh, as uh, were before the inner house. 
And What's the date of this? This would be on the um, early September. 2nd of September, I think, was the last amendment. Uh, yeah. Yes. So this was the government's position on 2nd September. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it had been the government position throughout. Yes. That, 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 I just wanted to... I, I understood your point. I just wanted to substantiate the text. Yes. Thank you. But anyway, the, the, the government position in the plea in Lords, there being no basis for reasonable apprehension that the UK government intends to advise the Queen to prorogue Parliament with the intention of denying before exit day sufficient time for proper parliamentary consideration of the withdrawal of the United Kingdom from the European Union, the order should be refused. That's the position throughout August, and it was maintained in September, and there are uh, pleadings which go on to that. That was the reason why... Yeah, sorry, I, I just want to get the dates right. That position is being made at the, maintained at the 2nd of September. Yes. And when does it change? It hasn't, it it? hasn't changed. Yes. No. But it, it, it's, it's not saying uh, that, 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 uh, that the, that the uh, government, uh, simply the government doesn't intend to prorogue. It's saying it doesn't intend to prorogue with the intention of denying sufficient time. Yes, indeed. Um, so that's, that's, one, has to read, one has to read the, 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 the uh, first element with the qualification of the second. Well, I, I hear Lord Keane saying exactly in triumph. Uh, the point <laughs> is that the uh, pleadings have to be candid and done in good faith. And even uh, Lord, the Lord President uh, said that he understood from the manner in which the pleadings were drafted in and this is something I'll come back to, in, in a way which might be called equivocal, tending to mislead, if not strictly lying. It, um, he, Lord, the Lord President said he assumed that the legal team had been kept in the dark and hadn't been told of the decisions which had been apparently taken on the 15th and 16th of August because one would have assumed that if a decision to prorogue had been taken, that in Canada that would have been reflected in the pleadings. Now, I think what's said against me is that, by Lord Keane, is that the government doesn't owe some kind of duty to a raggle tag of 75 parliamentarians who've decided to go to court in Scotland to challenge something before it's even happened. But, of course, the duty of candour is not owed to my clients, but it's owed to the court. And it's the court which has been told that there is no reasonable apprehension. It's the court which is potentially being misled. It's certainly not been given full and frank disclosure of the government's uh, position. I draw this to the court's attention because it's, that is the background, partly, against which the inner house treated with some degree of scepticism, the subsequent explanations and the revelations of a quite different uh, timetable uh, when various documents were, were brought to the court's attention on the 2nd of September. This should have been in the pleadings. They didn't put it in the pleadings. So it's really not good enough for my Lord Keane to suggest uh, that, well, in Scotland we don't have affidavits, so there's no problem with just um, putting in documents late and then saying, well, that's the truth. Or fact. Nobody says it's the truth, of course. There is no affidavit. There are just some floating documents with redactions which council speak to on the basis of whatever instructions they've got. But there's no affidavit in any of the Scottish pleadings whatsoever, not even the one which uh, has been referred to and was brought before the uh, Divisional Court in this case. So, that's the position. One has to remain in mind the chronology. The pleadings were to be adjusted in accordance with the court's timetable. Uh, that was after a decision had been made, but not made plain and not made known by those pleadings. On Wednesday, the 28th of August, we eventually do get the confirmation of what had been trailed in unattributable briefings 
uh, throughout the month of August through July, and in fact, prorogation was in fact going to be used. But the cunning change in it, the unexpected zigging instead of zagging, was that instead of having prorogation over Brexit Day itself, they would just take a big chunk of time out before Brexit Day. So, for example, the Northern Ireland Executive Formation Act 2019, the provisions which were added in against government opposition by backbenchers from Dominic Grieve to Lord Anderson of Ipswich, were predicated on what was then being leaked as government plans of proroguing Parliament over exit day. And so therefore the mischief which they were being told was contemplated was going to be blocked by amending the 2019 bill accordingly. But the cunning response of the government to that, which they now rely upon here, is that, well, that's what Parliament intended in terms of uh, it's uh, not wishing to be prorogued over a crucial time. So if we can find time within that timetable of the 2019 Act, that means we're acting lawfully because the 2019 Act says you have to bring your first report by the 4th of September, publish it, and then five days later, Parliament has to consider it. So, the 9th of September, says the 2019 Act, Parliament has to consider it. So Parliament, reading that Act, has to be sitting on the 9th of September. But the second report, under the 2019 Act, has to be produced by the 9th of October. Yes, your point is simply that they've taken every day that they could consistently with that act. Yes, they've seen a black hole and they've leapt into it. Um, <laughs> well, that's not quite the metaphor, but that'll do. Um, the, um, and then, but one knows, of course, so it, it, the 9th of October was the next date, and so five days after that, it was the 14th of October, so he presto, Parliament gets called back, and the 35 days they've managed to not contravene the 2019 Act, they, they say, uh, but, I mean, there may be other interpretations of that, I mean, as being suggested by Lady Black, uh, but, but that's, that's the rationale which is given uh, uh, for those dates. Uh, and thereafter, uh, the 2019 Act says that you've got to report every two weeks. So clearly what that had in mind was you're not going to prorogue us over Brexit Day. And so what they've done instead is, well, we'll prorogue you for the bit you forgot about. You know, it's clever, clever perhaps, but is it constitutional? What's its intent? What's its effect? That's the question for us. So the reasons, the only publicly published reasons for the decision to prorogue at this time, in this manner, and for this period, were produced in a letter from the Prime Minister dated the 28th of August, the day of the prorogation, to MPs. It might be worth just having a quick look at that, although... It may be difficult to find us in the Miller bundle. Um, Miller trial bundle, tab 47, MS page 354, or page 417 of the hard copy PDF. It's the other way around. <laughs> PDF hard copy, page 354, MS page 417. Yes, that's correct. Ah, Lionel Junior is very learned on these points. So, um, the letter is, I hope you had an enjoyable and productive summer recess with the opportunity of some rest ahead of the return to Parliament, the uh, return of the House. I'm going to update you on our business plans. Blah, blah, blah. This morning I spoke to Her Majesty the Queen to request an end to the current parliamentary session. Uh, second sitting week in September before commencing a second session of Parliament in the Queen's speech on Monday the 14th of October. Moves on. I fully recognise that the debate on the Queen's speech will be an opportunity 
So this is a four-day debate, or was it five days? Four or five days on the Queen's speech at the end of October. Second half of October will be an opportunity for members of Parliament to express their view on this government's legislative agenda and its approach to and the result of the European Council on the 17th, 18th of October. It is right that you should have the chance to do so in a clear and unambiguous manner. So you can express your view, but do you have time to do anything about it? Going on, I believe it's vitally important that the key votes associated with the Queen's speech uh, and any deal with the EU fall at a time when parliamentarians are best judged, best placed to judge the government's programme. Parliament will have the opportunity to debate the government's overall programme and approach to Brexit in the run-up to the European Council, so from the 14th of October. Should I succeed in agreeing a deal with the EU, Parliament will then have the opportunity to pass the bill required for ratification of the deal ahead of 31st October. Not really giving very much time for passing a bill on something potentially rather contentious. Um, even with the best will in the world, and I'm not sure there's so much of that around at the moment. The um, fact is that we're going to have five days spent on our Queen's speech debate uh, and then somehow it looks like the expectation of the government is that Parliament will rubber stamp whatever deal it manages to wrest from the European Union and pass a bill giving effect to its terms. It doesn't shout parliamentary accountability to me. Finally, I want to reiterate to colleagues that these weeks leading up to the European Council on the 17th, 18th of October are vitally important for the sake of my negotiations with the EU. Member states are watching what Parliament does with great interest. And it is only by showing unity and resolve that we stand a chance of securing a new deal that can be passed by Parliament. In the meantime, the government will take the responsible approach of continuing its preparations for leaving the EU with or without a deal. Now, we can interrogate this. And we can interrogate this with some scepticism. I note that my Lord Reid yesterday suggested that it was important to look at the particular memos and the wordings used and the reasoning given. That is absolutely right. It is important. But it is also important that you do not give the government the benefit of any doubt in this matter because of the manner in which the documentation has been produced and that there is therefore, the case law is quite strong from DAS and the judgment of uh, Lord Sales in the first instance in that case, which we've looked at, but it goes back not simply to uh, DAS and, and to the Belize international decision of Lord Walker, but it goes back to Padfield. And I'll come on and take particular, uh, I'll show the passage in Padfield I refer to, but it shows that in circumstances in which these documents have been produced, in the manner they've been produced, without a supporting affidavit, with redactions which are claimed and then leaked from time to time, that this government should not take on face value, this court should not take on face value what is said in those documents. The point I was making wasn't so much that um, they should be taken at face value as that they should not be ignored. Oh, absolutely and, not. Um, I don't want to ignore them. It wasn't apparent to me that the various factors put forward in the minute um, and reflected in the, uh, the other cabinet documents uh, had been taken into account in the opinions of the inner house. Well, I think they were. I mean, we, 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 we did go through this in, in some detail and uh, they clearly do quote from it. They do take it very seriously. But the important point also to bear in mind, the Lord, that I'll be coming on with a bit more specific criticism, but the only decision letter from the only decision maker in this case are the handwritten notes of the 16th of August 2019. And that doesn't set out the reasons. Let's look at that. It's at MS page 246.
No, there is a document beforehand on the 15th of August which sets out a variety of more or less plausible explanations. I think it's, if you're working from paper page, it's 316, I think. Is, is this the Prime Minister's comment on the De Costa memo that you're talking about? It's in, in our bundle. It's in, sorry, I'm back to the Miller bundle. I don't think I need to use I mean, the... Uh, it's your bundle. The cherry bundle. I'm, I'm giving up on Miller. Okay, so it's... Uh, can you give me the MS number again, please? The MS number on, on the cherry bundle is 246. Thank you. So the decision letter from the decision maker setting out his reasons, not saying, I agree with the suggestions you put forward, Nikki Da Costa, in your memo. One cannot presume, and I fear that was the, the, the approach which was being suggested by my Lord Reid, that just because it's set out in a memo by a special advisor or director of legislative affairs as to these are various reasons you can give as to why we might prorogue, that those were, in fact, the reasons for the prorogation. This isn't, doesn't fair to be suggesting reasons that you can give. If, if this isn't, as it were, providing an alibi. It's um, giving advice to the yes. Prime Minister. But it doesn't mean to say that well, it's precisely so. It is giving advice. It is not, it's the advice from someone who is not the decision maker. The decision maker is the Prime Minister in his memo. And what goes before it might well inform it, but we don't know because we have no affidavit. We've got no evidence as to what the real reasons were. All we've got is something which bears to be, and I've no, no, no idea when it was created, but has a, has a, has a, a date on it, the 16th of August, but there's no supporting affidavit saying that that's true or complete. But what we have is this whole September session, reading from 246, is a rigmarole introduced by, and we've subsequently had leaked to us, a blacked out bit, which was leaked, which was blacked out, presumably it was claimed uh, anything blacked out is either irrelevant or covered by legal professional privilege or law officers' convention. Not quite sure what introduced by that girly SWAT Cameron falls under. I certainly think it's potentially relevant. But anyway, the whole September session is a rigmarole introduced by that girly SWAT Cameron to show to the public that MPs were earning their crust. So, so that's, that's reason number one. Reason number two. So I don't see anything especially shocking about this prorogation. Reason number three. As Nikki notes, it is capitalised over the conference season so that the sitting days lost are actually very few. Ipsissima verba. That's all we've got. Because the only other use of the pen of the Prime Minister is in relation to at page 247 paragraph 2 recommendation following from a blacked out paragraph and I have no idea why that was blacked out recommendation are you content for your PPS to approach the palace with the request for prorogation to begin within the period 9th September to Thursday 12th September and for a Queen's speech on Monday 14th of October that's ticked yes that's the only paragraph ticked yes so if there were if there had been an affidavit or supporting document saying that, in fact, I looked at this recommendation and I was convinced by paragraphs 10, 11, I dodged 12 and 13 because that was the legal advice. I'm not going to tell you what that was. But I wasn't so convinced by 17, but 18 was. Then the court could work out because then the court would have cogent evidence, which, of course, if that had been put in, one would have asked for cross-examination uh, of it just to test its veracity. And the idea of cabinet ministers putting in affidavits explaining their actions is not simply confined to Australia and occasionally Scotland. But of course, in M against the Home Office itself, Kenneth Baker, the Home Secretary, personally put in an affidavit explaining why it was 
that the uh, asylum seeker in that case was ordered to be sent back to Zaire, notwithstanding the court order uh, requiring that he remain in the country. That affidavit was produced only at the Court of Appeal stage. I think Sir John Johnson said it's surprising it came so late. So there is no constitutional novelty or outrage in the idea that those cabinet ministers, including the prime minister, who make decisions which are being judicially reviewed, for which permission has been granted, uh, should actually explain themselves and see in relation to such documents as are relevant, what they took into account. So that's why I urge this court, as the Inner House quite properly did, to look at these documents, certainly look at them, but don't treat them as gospel. Don't treat them necessarily as the complete truth, as telling all the reasons. Nothing tells us that that is the case. When you say the complete truth, do you mean not the whole picture, that there might have been an elephant in the room when the document was written, as it were? The document might have been written knowing that it might subsequently be challenged, uh, uh, the decision might be challenged, and that therefore they need cover, for example. My, my Lord Reed is looking perturbed yes, and I, upset. I'm looking sceptical about well, that you, suggestion. Well, there's no reason to look sceptical. You can look upset, but the fact is... Read the documentation, and it says, we know this will potentially cause us a challenge. We have no affidavit that says this is true and complete. An affidavit would say this is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. One might not think that a government would engage in high politics, or would engage solely in high politics, as opposed to low, dishonest, dirty tricks. But I'm not sure we can assume that of this government given the attitude which has been taken publicly by its advisers and by the Prime Minister himself to the notion of the rule of law. So, look perturbed, look upset, but don't look sceptical. Look at the documentation. So, just looking at that documentation, page 247, the memo from Nikki da Costa. So we have a redacted paragraph three. We don't know why. Going over page to 248, there's a reference to uh, Parliament running out of business, ironically, really. And then at paragraph seven, the last Prime Minister was aware of these tensions. And for these reasons, dates were placed in the diary for a Queen's speech in April, May. 2019 and in October 2019. At the time, October was considered a very late end to the session, and as a result, the decision is now pressing. But what's not said there is that one presumes under Theresa May's premiership, and these were being pencilled in, this was before one knew that exit day had been extended to the 31st of October. That's a relevant consideration. So simply to say that the previous Prime Minister might have pencilled those in, or sort of semi-cleared it with the Queen beforehand, Really, dealing with the here and now, this is the 15th of August. We know when exit day is coming. Um, going on to paragraph 14, next page 249. Finally, politically, and so yes, we get the, the big blackout of the legal. wonder what that said. And the point which I make I repeated before the outer house and before the inner house and before this house, is that we and you, this court, should see the full unredacted versions of these documents for what they're worth. Because in putting in these documents in the manner in which they have, they have waived such claims as there might be to legal professional privilege and uh, legal advice privilege or law officers privilege. There's case law to that effect, a decision I think the Lord Reid was involved in in the inner house, Scottish Lion Cooperative. If you don't have a copy of that, I'll get it to you, but I've quoted the particular passage uh, on that. It's good law. It's law which applies to this case. But let's say with what we've got, work with what we've got, the redacted versions, 
Paragraph 14. Finally, politically, it is essential that Parliament is sitting before and after the EU Council. That's the one in 19th. We know not why politically it is essential, but that's what it said. MPs and peers must be in a position to consider what is negotiated and hopefully pass the withdrawal agreement bill. Well, you never know. They might, they might not. But at least they'll have seen what it was. If there is no deal, they need to have an opportunity to hear what you have to say and respond accordingly. That's all very true. But do you think that giving Parliament, what, 10 days? If, after your five days of chatting about the Queen's speech, is going to be enough to respond accordingly or hopefully pass the withdrawal agreement bill? Paragraph 18, page 250. Finally, it must be recognised that the situation has become more complicated because of because prorogation and on its own and separate of a Queen's speech has been portrayed as a potential tool to prevent MPs intervening prior to the UK's departure from the EU on the 31st of October. Who portrayed it as that? Well, I think it was a decision that was first mooted, I think, by uh, Jacob rees Mogg in March, now the Leader of the House. Gosh, it's from within government itself, now government itself, the suggestion that prorogation be used as a tool to prevent MPs intervening in the departure of the EU, uh, uh, the UK from the EU. And it's been portrayed as such in various leaks from non-attributable sources in Downing Street, which of course is what prompted this petition being drafted at the end of July in the first place. And then, the precedent for period of prorogation, page 250, the present proposal would mean that Parliament stood prorogued for a period of up to 34 calendar days. However, given the expected conference reset period, recess period of typically three weeks, the number of sitting days lost by such prorogation would be far less than that. One to three sitting days during the week commencing 9th September and four sitting days during the week commencing 7th October. Well, of course we know there is a vast difference, and I will go on to that, between if Parliament chooses to vote in favour of it going into recess for the conference period and it being unilaterally, without warning, told that the leader, Lord President of the Privy Council, is on a flight to Balmoral to get this Queen to sign off on the prorogation for which you've been given no prior notice. In essence, uh, Mr O'Neill, your argument is, is it not, that this memorandum, properly analysed, outlines possible lines of defence to the portrayal of um, the length of prorogation uh, as a means of stifling debate rather than actually addressing and articulating the practical reason for choosing five weeks. Yes, absolutely so, my lord. And, 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 and again, if one reads critically, and maybe cynically, the documentation, uh, we see that if you dig deep enough into it, it looks like the real reason is it's perhaps coming out rather than the one which has been presented for messaging purposes. If we see at page uh, 266, which appears to be a cabinet memorandum which the government has given us the privilege of seeing minutes of the cabinet meeting. So, uh, we note there, parliamentary business, page 266. The Prime Minister said he was grateful to colleagues for joining the call. It was important they were brought up to speed, you would think, on decisions that had been taken by him without Cabinet because he's exercising personal prerogative powers, it appears, in advising the Queen. Exiting the EU on 31st October was the first priority of the Government. So that's what they've been brought up to speed on, just in case they'd forgotten. 
However, it's also the domestic agenda stuff. Continuing, Prime Minister said he'd spoken to Her Majesty to request the session should end on a date between 9th and 12th September with a Queen's speech on Monday, 14th of October. This timetable gave Parliament ample time to debate Brexit in the period before the European Council. Ample time. Ample time. Is that really ample time? To debate, to hold to account, to potentially pass legislation to, if so advised, thwart the government's headlong rush to a no-deal Brexit? goes on, and again in the run-up to the UK's departure date on 31st October, it was important to emphasise that this decision to prorogue Parliament for a Queen's speech was not driven by Brexit consideration. Why was that important to emphasise that? And the first thing this minute says is Brexit exiting on the 31st October, do or die, is the government's first priority. Going over the page, the discussion says, any, page 267, any messaging should emphasise that the plan for a Queen's speech was not intended to reduce parliamentary scrutiny or to minimise Parliament's opportunity to make clear its views on Brexit. Well, it may or may not have been intended, but that was most certainly in its effect. But it might be said that the second sentence there doesn't fully answer the first. Yes, indeed, Parliament had already had a significant opportunity to debate Brexit and would still have remaining time to do so before 31st October. Likewise, it was crucial that parliamentary colleagues understood that the government was still seeking a deal and that this plan would allow a withdrawal agreement to be approved by Parliament if a deal was agreed. Again, the presumption is Parliament's just there to rubber stamp whatever they managed to get back. Therefore, any suggestion that the government was using, tactic as a t uh, using this as a tactic to restrain Parliament should be rebutted. D. The terrain between now and October would be rocky. The government would be attacked for this decision, but it would be manageable. So, the Lord read that points up the awareness uh, of the potential for attack. It doesn't specify whether in the courts or uh, politically, but they certainly are aware of its controversial nature. Going on, uh, 268, subparagraph F, it was important that the messaging did not appear to be to pit the government against MPs. And then going down the page to uh, the penultimate paragraph, continuing, the Prime Minister said it was vital to persuade and enthuse parliamentary colleagues to get behind the government's plan. The EU were likely to hold out for Parliament to block Brexit while they thought that was possible. That's important. That's a consideration. The EU are relying on the democratic elected representative legislature to express its will by potentially blocking Brexit, and that would appear to impede public policy. How much easier then to get round that by simply closing down Parliament for a significant period so that it wouldn't be able to hold out, the EU would not be able to hold out for Parliament to block Brexit. Going on, the backstop was fundamentally undemocratic. It bound the e UK into EU laws. It gave Dublin a greater say over matters in Northern Ireland. Progress of the EU should not be exaggerated. It was substantial. While there was a good chance that a deal could be secured, there was also a high chance it could not. Success would require a united and determined approach. So that's what this is about. We're all in this together. We're all singing from the same hymn sheet because anyone singing a different hymn has been silenced because Parliament's not sitting anymore. So, yes, those are the documents which have to be read in full and carefully and sceptically. And that is not some kind of, as I say, constitutional <coughs> innovation. I referred the court uh, to the case of uh, Padfield.
it is one case which we didn't have on our bundle, but I think it might have been Yeah. I don't have very much time. So let me just read out a bit <laughs> while my Leonard Jr. finds a reference. Padfield, page 997, uh, 1968 appeal cases, Lord Upjohn. Uh, he is. Uh, is giving a judgment in which he agrees with uh, Lord Reed. And in that, that passage, he draws adverse inferences from the weakness of the affidavits which had been lodged in that case. He says this, I'll turn to uh, the uh, minister's second letter of May the 3rd, 1965, which says that you will appreciate that under the 1958 Act, the minister has unfettered dis discretion to decide whether or not to refer a particular complaint to the Committee of Investigation. In reaching that decision, he has had in mind the normal democratic machinery of the Milk Marketing Board. This introduces the idea, much pressed upon your Lordships in argument, that he had an unfettered discretion in this matter. Thus it was argued, this it was argued means, provided that the Minister complained, considered the complaint bona fide, that was an end of the matter. He goes on, my lords, I believe that the introduction of the adjective unfettered and its reliance thereon in answer to the appellant's claim is one of fundamental matters confounding the minister's attitude, bona fide though it might be. First, the adjective nowhere appears in this section. It's an unauthorised gloss. Secondly, even if it did contain that adjective, I doubt it would make any difference in law to his powers. We have Padfield at tab 18 of the supplemental uh, authorities for this appeal in the Miller case. I'm very grateful to you so far. That's at page 226 electronically. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> Supplemental bundle, tab 18. And which page of the judgment itself are you reading from? Uh, I'm reading from page 1061. Thank you very much. I think that was from 1060, but I'm going on to 1061. Thank you. Uh, anyway, I was I got to the point where he says, Lord Upjohn says it doesn't matter whether or not, even if even if the statute had said you had unfettered uh, discretion, it would not make a, a, a difference. I doubt it would make any difference in Lord's power. It's safe to emphasize uh, what he has already, namely that acting lawfully he has a power of decision which cannot be controlled by the courts, it is unfettered. But the use of that adjective even in an act of parliament can do nothing to unfetter the control which the judiciary have over the executive, namely that in exercising their powers, the latter must act lawfully, and that is a matter to be determined by looking at the act and its scope and object and conferring a discretion upon the minister rather than by the use of adjectives. Now, in this case, uh, it's said against me, well, there isn't any act to look at, although, of course, I've got the claim of right of 1689 Act. Push that one too much. The point is, you look at the Constitution, you look at the principles of the Constitution, you look at the principle of accountability, and you see, is this use of the power of prorogation in these circumstances, for this period, at this time, compatible with the fundamental role of Parliament at this particular time? Not generally, not last year. 50 years ago or 50 years hence, here and now today, is the way they have used this power compatible with understanding of the primary principle of accountability of the executive to, mark, to Parliament? Um, Lord Upton goes on, the matter didn't end there, for in his affidavit the minister referred to, so the minister's affidavit referred to the letter without disapproval he quotes the letter. In considering how to exercise his discretion, the minister should, amongst other things, address his mind to the possibility that if a complaint were referred in the committee to where it hold it, he in turn would be expected to make a statutory order to give effect to the committee's recommendations. It is this consideration, rather than the formal eligibility of the complaint as a subject for investigation, that the minister would have in mind in determining whether your particular complaint is a suitable one for a reference to the committee. We were unable to hold out any prospect that the minister would be prepared to regard it as suitable. It goes on, this fear of parliamentary trouble, for in my opinion, this must be the scarcely veiled meaning of the letter. So Lord Upjohn is looking at what is 
really being said beneath the veil of the particular wording. And that's fear of parliamentary trouble. If an inquiry were ordered and its possible results is alone sufficient to vitiate the Minister's decision, which, as I have stated earlier, can never validly turn on purely political considerations. He must be prepared to face the music in Parliament. The statute has cast upon him an obligation in the proper exercise of a discretion conferred upon him to order a reference to the Committee of Investigation. He must be prepared to face the music in Parliament. That's what happens when you're exercising your power under a statute. It applies equally when applying and using a power which, for the time being, remains with the executive, but it only remains with the executive because it's been permitted to remain with it by the supreme sovereign body under our constitution, which is Parliament. And it did not give it carte blanche in leaving that power for the time being, because Parliament works within the constitution. And it will not authorise unconstitutional actions. This is slightly reminiscent of the argument which my Lord Reid put forward in AXA in relation to the Scottish Parliament, that a body created by a parliament in a liberal constitutional democracy cannot ever be assumed to be allowed to contravene fundamental rights or fundamental constitutional principles. And that's what my Lord Reid said of an understanding, proper understanding of this role of the Scottish Parliament <coughs> in our constitution. That Parliament, the Union Parliament, would not create something which could break or go against constitutional fundamentals. The same principle applies here. There is not, and what's happening from the other side is because they've got the magic word of prerogative, they think they can do whatever they like with it, unless and until they're expressly and explicitly stopped. Hence the argument about, well, we, we managed to find the black hole of the Northern Ireland Executive Act and everything else is political, and so courts stand back. That's not how the Constitution works. Everybody is subject to the law. The Executive and the Constitution. The Executive, Parliament and this Court. No one has unfettered power. No one has absolute power. That is what the Glorious Revolution was about, the 1689 settlement. It was precisely to say that, no, there are no sources of power direct from God, unfettered and unchallengeable and unaccountable, which rest in the executive in this country. It is Parliament which reigns here. And it is now a parliament which is representative and democratically based. And therefore, it reigns because of its accountability ultimately to the people. So, as I understood Sir James's submissions in response to some questioning earlier on from the Lord Kerr, he expressly accepted that if the only limits on derogative power and the extent of that power, then the lowest possible limits are those of respect for fundamental rights and the principles of the Constitution. Clearly, those fundamental principles of the Constitution must include what I've underlined as parliamentary sovereignty, the subordination of the executive to the law, accountability to parliament, and the democratic accountability of parliament uh, to the people. So, if, as I understood Sir James, but doubtless I'll be corrected, there was an acceptance uh, that where prorogation inhibits, it is what it is, he says, inhibits necessarily Parliament's ability to hold the government to account 
may impede it from legislating as it might otherwise wish to, then there have to be justiciable limits as to the extent to which it can use that power compatibly with our Constitution. Once Parliament has been prorogued, the only constitutional actor still standing is the courts. So therefore, it is for the courts, as our Constitution works, to determine whether or not the power of prorogation has lawfully and constitutionally been exercised by the executive, because it's impossible for Parliament to hold them to account on that. This does not mean that we're asking the court to identify an appropriate length of time as to whether Parliament wishes to legislate, as to whether Parliament should in fact uh, decide or ensure that it was uh, recalled. What it does mean is that in extremis, where we are in this unique situation, because of the potential irreversible constitutional changes, because of the potential dangers accepted even by the government in its yellow hammer documents of a cliff edge no deal uh, Brexit, then the constitution is unbalanced and the role of this court is to rebalance it by ensuring that parliament is in fact able, if so advised, for it to decide how it should sit, when it should sit, what it might do in that period of sitting. We cannot have a situation in which there are no standards where prorogation can be used with impunity to close down Parliament whenever it becomes inconvenient. And it's not. Departing from what Lord Panic said, it's not a question of just how long it is. Is it all right for two days? Is it all right for three weeks? How far can I go? Okay, five weeks, maybe that's a bit too much. It's not about the length. It's about what it's doing to our constitution. That's why I constantly emphasise it is certainly how long is this prorogation for, but when is it being used, and what is the constitutional background, what are the issues which would otherwise be before Parliament for it to call the executive to account and potentially to legislate on. In this case, it's the potential for leaving the European Union on exit day with or without a deal. We know that the intention of Parliament in the 2018 Withdrawal Act, clearly the terms of Section 9 and 13 of that Act, say that Parliament has to be involved in those decisions, in the decision as to the terms upon which we might properly leave the European Union. This is not a matter for foreign affairs prerogative or the like for the Crown to enter into such treaties, international agreements as it thinks best. Parliament is involved and Parliament is involved in part because of uh, this court's uh, decision uh, in Miller. But picking up on what was done in Miller which reaffirmed that constitutional principle that the Crown has no power to attenuate, uh, modify remove individuals' rights, and that included EU law rights, and that therefore, at the very least, there needed to be parliamentary authority for any such action which did impact upon individual rights. That's what the majority of this court founded and founded uh, correctly. Where the court perhaps went slightly wrong was in falling for the bullet being fired from a gun analogy, uh, in which, or upon which, having accepted that, it was said that notification in and of itself uh, was sufficient to impact upon individual rights. Well, we always have a difficulty, don't we, especially in a public law case, uh, as to whether we should accept the agreement of the parties as to what the state of affairs is, which, of course, for obvious reasons, the parties were in agreement as to that matter, or, or whether we should challenge it and not accept it. That is always a difficult question. Uh, rightly or wrongly, we decided to accept the agreement of the parties. I'm not, I'm not being critical. It may sound to be critical. I'm not being critical. All I'm saying is that we read Miller now 
in the light of the Lord, Lord, Lord Gunworth presently saw it, saying that this is a bad analogy. It's going to be take two years before that bullet reaches a target. Well, what, and whatever, affects the, the whatever the particular facts of Miller are, I mean, the, the principle established was clear. Yes, that's my, that, absolutely. The principle is absolutely right. But the point is that in the light of Whiteman, the, the full court decision in Whiteman, it is clear that notification is in those two years revocable, that the bullet can be called back. And so therefore, it's only when it actually hits the target, and it only hits the target when the United Kingdom ceases to be a member of the European Union, and it does that by operation of Article 50, subsection 3, that the principle in Miller that the executive cannot do this on the basis of its prerogative or powers alone, but has to be expressly authorised by Parliament, then applies. And we're still waiting for the authorisation of Parliament to allow for that. Section 9 of the 2018 Act and, and these memos are predicated upon the idea that once a withdrawal agreement comes back, then Parliament will pass a statute which will do the necessary Miller thing of allowing individual rights to be affected by the withdrawal uh, of the United Kingdom from the European Union. What this <coughs> government seems to have failed to understand in its uh, reference to uh, there being a no-deal Brexit, however, is that there is no statutory provision which in any sense authorises this government to leave the European Union with the inevitable effect that has on individual rights without a deal. There is no no-deal statute. So one of the other reasons as to why this decision to prorogue is flawed is because it's based on an error of law. It presumes that, and it is aimed at, we are seeking to prorogue Parliament in order if it happens to be the case, to be able to crash out without a deal. They have no authority to do that. They've mistaken, they've, they've misdirected themselves. Um, the issue of uh, the interlocutor pronounced by the inner house we're going to deal with, you know, with 15 minutes left, so we're going to have to not talk too long. No, sir. Um, you have 17 minutes precisely. And I will stick to that, my lady. I might even stop early, depending on how much barricade I get. But um, mm, that's. Barricade. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. <laughs> let's not go there. No, let's not go there. Okay. Um, the interlocutor was pronounced by the in house in accordance with standard uh, uh, practice uh, of uh, the court of session, which is that if you. Um, have a order which is found to be uh, 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 ultra virus or have been uh, issued unlawfully, then you reduce the order. It's a nullity, it's null and void. That standard procedure, it makes everybody, everything clear, everybody knows where they are, and that's why we reduce it. So there's no scope for misunderstandings or further equivocations or briefings or the like. The order is a nullity. It is a dead order. Um, now, perhaps in the more sophisticated jurisprudence of the uh, courts of England and Wales, there is suggestion of ultimately the remedy being a matter for uh, the discretion of the court um, using its equitable judgment in all those circumstances. Now, that's not really been developed frankly, in the Scottish jurisprudence, is a passing reference to the idea in the judgment of Lord Hope in EBA against the Advocate General, uh, 2011, UK Supreme Court cases, 29 at paragraph 27. But the generality is, he says this, paragraph 27, the grounds of judicial control of administrative action in Scotland are based on legal principle. Judicial review by the Court of Session is not an exercise of judicial discretion in contrast to what was said to be the position in English law. Every person who complains he has suffered a wrong because of an error or abuse of the power conferred on the decision maker is entitled to apply to the Court of Session for judicial review as of right in exactly the same way as it could have done by way of ordinary action before the rules of court were amended. 
He then goes on, and this is now changed, he does not have to apply for permission to do so. And then concludes, although the court has a discretion to refuse a remedy in judicial review on what may be described as equitable grounds, it has no discretion to refuse to entertain a competent action. Now, a discretion to refuse a uh, remedy on equitable grounds is not uh, further developed. But what are the equitable grounds here for refusing to grant the necessary order of reduction when it has been found to be unlawful? We have a history of a government which seems to cast doubt on quite how uh, binding uh, legal orders are in relation to them. Now, I know the Lord Hodge suggested, well, if we just have a declaration, a declarator, that will get us off a potentially difficult hook. Well, I'm afraid I'm not one for letting courts off hooks in that sense. This is uh, an important point. We are entitled to an effective remedy. Ubi use, ibi remedium. The remedy which naturally flows from a finding of unlawfulness is a simple reduction. Yes, that means that the decision maker can then, as properly advised in law, if so advised, reconsider matters and issue a new decision. But in no sense is there any basis uh, for it to be said that somehow the order which has been found to be unlawfully made somehow subsists in validity uh, pending its reconsideration so Parliament uh, is still suspended, which I assume is the basis upon which it is being suggested, uh, as I say belatedly, that to have an order for reduction in circumstances of the inner house's judgment is a breach of Article 9 of the Bill of Rights because it contravenes parliamentary privilege. The clues in the name, parliamentary privilege. What they're trying to do is the usual cloaking it, if we rush in to the House of Commons and then say, you're paroled, that's a parliamentary privilege and you can't question that in courts. That's not what the Bill of Rights was ever intended to do. Article 9 of the Bill of Rights was intended to stop the Crown from prosecuting MPs for using their free speech in Parliament and then subjecting them to uh, criminal or civil suits uh, for things which the Crown found to be insulting. That's what Article 9 is about. It's not a manner in which to cloak executive action in some other form of immunity. That's a complete misunderstanding and misreading of the Constitution. As far as I can see, you didn't actually seek reduction or, or obtain it. You know, the remedies sought in Article 18 were declarator and interdict. Yeah, well, yeah. And, and what you, well, what you, you got... Have to remember, we stuck by the rules and the timetable in this. Yeah, what, you, what you got is a declarator. Yeah, no, but we stuck by the rules and the timetabling on this. So what, and also, uh, as always in judicial review petitions, it says, or any other remedy as to yes, the court is appropriate. Yes. Now, in this case, the pleadings were finalised on the 27th of August in accordance with the court's interlocutor. Now, that was before the prorogation happened. So we've never had an opportunity of responding and taking into account the prorogation. We've done a really quite a good job, actually, in anticipating what they might have done uh, because we read the observer. But um, that, you know, if, if I had the opportunity, and if I did, but because the court fixed the timetable, I finalised the pleadings at the date the court asked. They subsequently added something in, but we've never had an opportunity of responding. So I rely upon uh, the, the general judicial review uh, request uh, of uh, any other remedy as is appropriate in the circumstances. And the remedy which is appropriate in the circumstances, we were originally seeking declarator and interdict. Uh, we now seek uh, declarator and reduction in accordance with the principle of effective remedy. And reduction of what? Reduction of the order in council on the 28th of August. That's the decision that was made. Well, and that's not, again, a constitutional difficulty. Well, it's a, I, I can understand you're asking us to do that. It's not what the Inner House did. Well, that's what I asked them to do. I mean, you know, I, they don't always listen to me. Um, but, yes. Could you have amended your pleadings? I'm sorry, could, I could amend them if you want me to, yes. No, but could you have before the Inner House? No. I mean, it was, it, I, my Lord, I, this, again, just let's remember the timetable. This, this has happened two weeks ago in six days. 
on Wednesday, three weeks ago, I was phoned up being told there was going to be a prorogation. We were in court, and I was drive, I drive 400 miles up from Devon for my holiday. I'm in court on Thursday arguing for interim interdict. We even served the petition on the, or attempted to, on the Queen in Balmoral on the basis of what was being picked up earlier on as in the possibility uh, that the Queen had an option of not uh, acceding to uh, advice. This is a purely technical inquiry because of my ignorance of Scottish procedure. If the time had been allowed, if there had been, I'm sorry, if the time had existed, it would have been possible for you to apply for an amendment before the inner house. Yeah, but I'm, 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 setting, I'm setting out what actually happened. We then had... And, yes, and, and it really, it, it, I, I just wanted to know whether it was technically possible. Oh, I, you would have to ask their permission. Yes. But, uh, but, but, but you don't, because judicial route is a flexible procedure. I mean, I got... In, in the, and where pleadings don't count so much, they, they, I refer to what Lord Hope said in Somerville against the Scottish Minister. We've got to be succinct and clear and to the point, and it's broad enough to allow for it. So we put in everything we could. But we had a hearing on interim remedies on the Thursday. We then had a judgment saying it was, that was being refused in hoc statue until the full hearing, which was brought forward to the Tuesday. We got a full hearing from the Lord Order on Tuesday. We then got a judgment on the Wednesday, uh, which was then heard before the inner house on Thursday and Friday. I mean, I've done my best, but I can't. <laughs> do the pleadings as well. Not being <laughs> critical at all. Don't, don't be defensive, uh, Mr. O'Neill. <laughs> <Anyway, laughs> I simply wanted to know what the situation was. Yes, well, I mean, the, 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 the strict point is there was no there was no strict need to amend the written pleadings, but you could have requested the, the inner house to pronounce reduction for the sake of clarity. But as it turned out, I didn't need to request anyone. Anyway. What is the difference technically uh, between? A, a, a declaration that says that something is null and void and um, an order for reduction. It's just making it, uh, uh, it's making it entirely clear. I mean, it's, uh, so, it's, it's harking back to Section 21 of the Crown Proceedings Act, 1947, isn't it? And it would be clearer to know, for example, if, if the order in council had been quashed, mm -hmm. if the appointment of commissioners had been quashed, then we would know where we stand. As it is, we have a a vaguer way of putting it that the, the prorogation following thereon, that is to say following on from the advice is um, unlawful and therefore null, null and void well, I, 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 the, 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 null the and particular of no wording of, of any declarator is a matter ultimately for the court doing justice in the circumstances of the case um, I can suggest what the declarator might be but ultimately the court pronounces its interlocutor in, in appropriate terms but I say it's not enough to have a declarator because, in a sense, one's harking back to that old, again, English law deference to you don't pronounce uh, coercive orders against the Crown because the Crown can't be impleaded before uh, its own courts uh, and all that, but you can get a declaration against an officer of the Crown acting outside. The whole aim against the Home Office stuff that came up but we, we, we had this discussion in Davidson against the Scottish ministers and we're absolutely clear that the older Scottish approach which is it doesn't matter who you are even if you're the king himself which is why James VI was so glad to leave Scotland you are called before the courts and accountable to them and you have to obey the rules that's the traditional Scottish approach which has been reaffirmed by Davidson against the Scottish ministers saying that the policy of Section 21 of the Crown Proceedings Act 1947 is limited to private law claims and not a public law judicial review. What's the paragraph in your case that indicates an aspiration to have reduction? Um, it's fairly early on because this, this challenge only came in... Um, well, tomorrow, could we be given the paragraph? Yes, in my case... It's, yeah, in my case... I think Don't I, waste time on it now. Give it to us tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, my lord. I'll, 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 I'll. Please. Anyway, many of these arguments were run before, and, and there's a transcript handily of the arguments I ran before the Lord Ordinary. If there's any suggestion that uh, anything or much of this is new. Um, 
one point I do want to highlight again is this internal issue about is being suggested. I think that um, <clears throat> Parliament uh, could have, in the, in, the, in, the, in the short period it had left to it, uh, before prorogation, once it knew about prorogation, have legislated to have um, against pr its prorogation in some way, instead of uh, spending what little time it had on passing the, uh, the Ben Act, requiring an extension. So, second-guessing Parliament. So, I think the suggestions then made, because it didn't do that, then Parliament's uh, perfectly happy to be paroled, and it would be uh, an intrusion on the separation of powers if this court were to suggest uh, otherwise. Well, I'm sorry, but the whole point about an act which would affect the pro prorogation power, the prerogative, is one which Erskine May tells us requires the Queen's consent to the bill. So this government could have said, if you try and affect our prorogation power, we will not give the necessary assent to the bill before it even gets to uh, through the whole processes of Parliament and is set to royal assent. So they held all the cards in that regard, and it is not, in fact, the case, as was suggested, that somehow this court can draw an inference from the fact that Parliament, in this short time that it had, uh, didn't legislate against the prorogation which had been ordered against it. Because there's certainly no suggestion I heard uh, from anyone appearing for the government in this case that, of course, the government would have assented to any such uh, uh, bill had it had even thought to put it before them. Uh, Erskine May is absolutely clear on this. Paragraph 9.6 and 30.79. Bills affecting the royal prerogative require the Queen's consent. Thus, consent has been required for bills affecting prerogatives to dissolve, summon, or prorogue Parliament. So, that answers that. Let's see. I mean, it was being suggested by the... Uh, again, I, I mean, I draw the analogy. The idea that, well, Parliament had four days, and they, they passed one bill, but they could have passed another bill. It's like somebody, an arsonist has come into your house, and, uh, is, you know, the fire is raging in the kitchen, and you try and put it out in the kitchen, um, and then they say, yeah, well, you didn't do anything in the living room, so you must have consented to being burnt down. Then. I mean, there's only so much time that people have to deal with firefighting, to deal with the crisis. And they, deal, they dealt with it as best they could, prioritising what they could after a summer of negotiations and cross-party negotiations. These cross-party bills in the face of concerted government opposition are not easy things to pass. Uh, and this one passed by the grace of God. Um, uh, or whatever the formula is, the Lord's spiritual and temporal. Um, but it happened and it, it was done. But they certainly cannot say that because they didn't pass uh, some non-prorogation act that they consented to prorogation. So we just dismiss that straight away. So I think I better sum up and finish. In Whiteman, before the full court of 27 judges in Luxembourg, uh, the President, Kuhn Lennox, said, this is our Marbury against Madison moment. What he meant was by that, I think, that there was the realisation that within the European Union legal system, there was this was a fully and properly constitutional moment. I say to this court, don't let this case be your Dred Scott moment. Instead, stand up for the truth, stand up for reason, stand up for unity in diversity, stand up for parliament, stand up for democracy by dismissing this government's appeal and uphold a constitution governed by laws and not the passing whims of men. We've got here the mother of parliament being shut down by the father of lies, rather than allowing lies to triumph. Listen to the angels of your better nature and rule that this prorogation is unlawful and abuse of power, which has been entrusted to the government. This government is showing itself unworthy of our trust as it uses the powers of its office in a manner which is corrosive of the constitution 
and destructive of the system of parliamentary representative democracy upon which our union polity is founded. Enough is enough. Dismiss this appeal and let them know that. That's what truth speaking to power sounds like. Lords and ladies, please make some questions. Thank you, Mr. Ernie. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Wolf? Very well. Well, we will now adjourn uh, and resume at 10.30 tomorrow morning uh, to hear some of the interveners and then uh, the reply from Lord Keane and the reply from Lord Panic. Court is now adjourned.